Then you have alternative um, investments, which is real estate or syndications. And that's scary because no one understands it. Welcome to the Real Estate Mogul MD Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and taking control of your financial future. This is a show where we not only motivate and inspire, we give you actionable, real-world experience to help you live life by design. You'll hear journeys and stories from other physicians, investors, coaches, consultants, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, Brett Riggins. Have you ever presented uh, your idea to a financial advisor about investing in real estate, maybe a syndication, maybe single family? Uh, what, What was the answer that you got? Uh, I think it's always peculiar the way that uh, we lean on certain professionals in our life to, to give us their opinion. Well, sometimes when we look at these types of investments, since they are still considered alternative investments, we need to make sure we're asking the right people. Uh, today's guest was actually a, uh, a financial advisor back in the past, but now he is the chief executive officer and founder of Left Field Investors. And this is a community that I want you to check out. Uh, I'm excited to share today's conversation with you and learn more about the community that will help us go from thinking about investing in real estate um, and syndications and getting over that wall of of it being scary, a scary alternative. Please welcome Jim. Pfeiffer to the show. All right, Mr. Jim Pfeiffer, uh, welcome to the show. And man, first, right off the bat, I have to say Pfeiffer and not Pfeiffer. And it's kind of like, it's funny from the outside looking in, but you probably get that mixed up a lot, huh? I, I do. I don't know why, you know, our family pronounces it Pfeiffer. I, I lived in Germany for three years and everyone pronounced it precisely wrong, um, but right. also precisely right for their language. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, Jim Pfeiffer, welcome to the show, man. And you're coming to us from left field. Absolutely. Left field investors. That's our, uh, that's our community of passive investors. Awesome. And what a great name. And the first, before we jump into this, obviously you're not a physician. I'm not a physician, but um, our listeners are physicians and we'll get to how, how we're in the same ball field or ballpark together. I'm just going to lay out the puns all day long today. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so where, where did, I mean, where did left field come from? I see on the website here, leftfieldinvestors.com on the um, about about us page where there's a group of fellows here that founded this group. And I love it. Every It's all about baseball. I grew up playing baseball. I love it. Um, left field, obviously that piece. And then the, the pictures of everybody in uh, the baseball uniforms, who's the baseball player. That's the funny part. None of us. Um, the, uh, the name came, I'm, I'm a former financial advisor and my colleagues would always say whenever talked about real estate or syndications, they'd say, oh, Jim, you're way out there in left field. So when we were trying to come up with a name, um, that's what we came up with. But no one's a real baseball fan. But we decided if we're going to have that name, we're going all in. And, you know, on my podcast, I I interviewed a uh, a base, a former Major League Baseball player. And I didn't have the uh, I I, I couldn't tell him, you know, because he was all excited and jazzed about the baseball stuff. And I I couldn't tell him, you know, we're we're not really baseball fans. It's just in our name. (laughs) Interesting. So way out in left field, what does that mean? Like if, so you were in syndication, you were talking to somebody about it and they told you, you were way out in left field. What does that mean? Well, so I was a financial advisor, which means, you know, I was, I was selling um, paper assets, right? Which to me now looking back paper assets, the stock market or your 401k or, or any of these um, assets you're, you're basically buying it with no current benefit, right? You're not getting paid. You might get a small dividend, but you're not getting paid during the hold period. So it's speculation. You're buying a piece of paper, you're holding it for a while, and you hope to sell it to somebody else for more at a later date. And so that's what we were doing. But then I found real assets, real estate, right? Where you could buy a piece of real estate, get a current benefit, current benefit in the form of cash flow, and then you'd also get appreciation on the back end. And so I, I would... I eventually I got out of financial advising because I always prided myself in putting my clients into the same things I was uh, investing in. But you can't do that as a financial advisor if you're in real estate because I'm not licensed for it and I don't get paid for it. So I would talk about it with my financial advising colleagues and that's where they would say, "Oh, that real estate stuff, you know, that that's out in left field. It's so risky, you know, it's and and all these misconceptions because they weren't taught about it. They didn't know about it. That's why your financial advisor, when you when you bring a real estate deal to them, they are going to say it's risky and and say it's not a good idea because they don't understand it. That's not their world. They are just hyper-focused on 
you know, these paper assets that they're paid to sell. It doesn't mean they're bad people. They know what they're doing in that area. They just don't know anything beyond that, typically. And are there any limitations that you can think of? Obviously, each firm is going to be a little different. Uh, maybe even each certification may be a little different. That would keep uh, a, a financial advisor from investing in real assets like real estate. Like I, I've heard it, I've heard it a couple of times, Jim, where a financial advisor, one that I've worked with, I would say, I can't do that. I'm not allowed to do that. What is that about? Yeah, it depends on the licenses, right? And so the SEC, if you have the SEC licenses, they're very restrictive on what you can do and what you can recommend your clients do. Part of the reason that I I gave up my licenses was because they wouldn't let me do certain things like invest with a group, right? Invest with others. I couldn't put my clients into real estate deals that I was investing in myself. And so there's all these restrictions. And some of it is based on the company you work at. Some of it's just the SEC rules and regulations. So I had to give up my licenses so I could do some of these things. And then eventually I realized, you know, I, just paper assets, it's, it's, it's speculation to me. And so I want to be, I want to be an investor and that's where real estate came in for me. And so here we are out in left field. Absolutely. Now, now left field, man, it gives me goosebumps to say that I have not invested in any syndications yet. But uh, understanding the process, understanding the people, understanding the the pros and the cons um, to scenario and each scenario is going to be a little different. But, man, it feels to be it feels good to be out here in left field, doesn't it? It does. I mean, I feel so much better. I don't track the stock market. I don't care if it's up or down. You know, even now, there's uncertain times in the economy. It's it's having there's some real estate that's in some some real bad shape. But most of my investments continue to cash flow. I'm a full time passive investor. All of our income for our family comes from these investments that we've made, and we're still cash flowing. And I'm not worried about whether the values go up and down because I'm a ca- I'm a cash flow investor. Yeah. And uh, my my niche, my lane is in, currently in my portfolio, single family, but it's the same kind of approach where it's uh, we buy for cash flow. And if that yeah. thing appreciates, it's going to be a situation where we uh, depreciate, then sell it to capture the appreciation and then exchange and then do it again. So it's that same scenario where we're buying for cash flow. And, you know, if if and when we sell, then uh, that appreciation happens. But we also get rent increase, right? We get rent increase. Yeah. And then we can also capture similar, I'm sure, capture the the growth, the appreciation, the growth in the market value by refinancing, too, which uh, which in single family is a little different than in multifamily. But, man, it's it's similar because it's it's real assets. Yeah. And and you also, and this happens in single family. I used to be a single family investor and has happens in multifamily, especially at times like this where, you know, inflation and interest rates are going up. Inflation erodes away the debt on your asset, right? So that's another way that you earn a return on your real estate is because as the dollar inflates, your debt becomes less, right? Because the dollar is worth less. So um, there's a lot of different ways to make a return. And all the ways that you make returns on single family are similar in multifamily or self-storage or mobile home parks, all these different asset classes that you know we look to in, in syndications that we can diversify away from just one specific asset class. You get a lot of those same benefits. And, and taxes, you mentioned, you know, where you can do the, the 1031 exchange, I'm assuming what you're talking about. Yes, sir. Um, you know, taxes are the largest eroder of a person's wealth. So if you can get as much as much of your assets into the, you know, bucket three, which is the passive income bucket where passive income is offset by passive loss, then you're not paying any tax if you do it right. And and in syndications, you know, we do what's called a lazy 1031, which we don't have like the thing I don't like about the 1031 exchange is it always requires you to get a bigger, larger asset with bigger, larger debt. And you have these timing windows where you have to buy something and identify, I don't know all the rules, but it's just crazy. The lazy 1031, you basically, whenever you sell an asset and you have that depreciation recapture, if you go and buy another asset, you get an- another load of depreciation and it offsets the gains on your sale. So it makes it really easy to just avoid or defer legally. And again, I'm not a tax advisor, but you can avoid um, paying taxes at all if you're if you're into the real estate. And that's awesome. So the, the lazy 1031 in the syndication, yes. I like that idea. And I just learned recently too that, you know, as an LP, you, uh, given the specifics of each deal, obviously, but you have the ability to, uh, 
I guess, be awarded the depreciation in the deal. And when you have so much, you can keep it. And I think this is what you're talking about now. Say I my depreciation is exceeding my passive income bucket, then I don't have to necessarily take it all this year. I can hold it, right? And then defer it. And I can defer it to when I need it, when the bucket's getting bigger. Right. And that, that's exactly how you can hold it forever um, until you need it. And so a good example is, let's say you invest $100,000 in a multifamily syndication. You know, you should be able to get between 15 and 80% in tax loss in the first year. Totally depends. I once got 105% on a deal. It's wow. crazy. So let's say it's 50%. So you invest a hundred grand and you get a tax loss in year one of $50,000, right? Well, these deals usually don't cash flow a whole lot in the first year, but let's say you cash flow 8% in the first year. So that's $8,000 you've earned. Well, you have $50,000 of of loss. So in year one, you're not going to pay any tax on that $8,000 because it's offset. So then you go into year two with $42,000 of loss that you carry over. And so you know it's going to be five or six years before you have to pay any tax on on that investment and if you're if you continue investing in other deals you're going to find that you stack up this huge passive loss that you can use when your deals go full cycle meaning when the syndicator sells them and returns your capital with your with your gain it's you know we don't pay much tax if you do it in the right in the right way and that that's full cycle is huge because when these things uh either when they're refied and you're made whole that that turn where you're seeing that you know, 18, 20, 30% return. That's that bubble then that can be offset by this uh, a backlog of depreciation, right? And yep. I think it's perfect, Jim, that you mentioned, um, you know, I don't see a C, the, the, the three letters at the end of your name, CPA. So making that clear that we are not uh, yes. certified public accountants. We're not tax attorneys. We nope. only do this through our own portfolios, through our own experience and share our experience with everybody. So it's great to note. But this this bucket, I, I, I love it that way that you've, you've, you know, you've put it in buckets and diversifying permanent passive income is is a necessity it's not a luxury and i think that's what we're i'm continuing to preach here on the show um in ways to do that too but this as we stack up this depreciation can the depreciation from one specific syndication one specific property offset other as long as it's passive as long as it's inside that passive bucket yeah so so there's again you already said it, not a tax person, right. but there, there's basically three buckets. Bucket one is your W-2, your, your paycheck, which, you know, if we're talking to doctors, they got a lot in that bucket. And then the next bucket over bucket two is portfolio income, which is um, gains on stock market, stuff like that. Um, and then this bucket three is the passive uh, income. And yes, so let's say when I sold all, I had a bunch of single family homes and I had a bunch of small multifamily homes that I owned all by myself, you know, or, or we, we owned and we sold them and we had, you know, the market saved us because we weren't very good at managing those properties, but market has been going up. And so we had huge gains on all of those. And, and to, to, um, I went to my accountant and I said, you know, Hey, I, I don't really want to pay all these taxes. What can I do? And he, he said two things. One I didn't like, which was, he said, you know, Jim, sometimes when you make a bunch of money, you got to pay a bunch of tax. I'm like, Oh, okay. And the second thing he said is, well, there's, there, there's this thing called the lazy 1031. And he explained it to me. And so I went and invested in syndications that passive real estate, right. And that offset the gains that I made on my active real estate. So I sold, you know, all of my single family and all of my multifamily properties and I didn't pay tax on those properties because I invested the proceeds and some of the um, the initial capital into syndication investments that got me a lot of depreciation, got me that tax loss. Very interesting. And when we're talking about buckets too, um, there's an old Hank Williams song that goes something like, my bucket's got a hole in it. And <laughs> those, those, uh, those holes, man, are taxes. Just like you say, that's a hole in your bucket. And- Interest. So uh, that's interesting too. the way that we leverage capital interest can can be will be one of the big biggest holes in our bucket. And if we're not focused on this stuff, it it makes a a huge difference. But in syndication, in a passive scenario, we don't have to worry about that. That's not that's not what we're specifically worried about. Obviously, we vet the GPs and the sponsors uh, because that's their that's their world. And that's what they need to be working on. So um Man, the buckets, the buckets, the buckets out in left field. Tell us a little bit about, Jim, about uh, um, 
how left field started with the rest of the partners. Uh, the yeah. Founders. So, so I was an active real estate investor and, and I was transitioning to passive and I had started a group in Columbus, Ohio, where I live for active investors. And it was, it was great. We had, you know, a lot of people would show up. We did a lot of business together. And so as I was exiting active, I kind of, you know, I, I talked to some people there and I said, Hey, I'm going to start a passive group. And the goal was just to a mastermind, right? Get 12 people. We're going to go out to dinner once a month in Columbus. And that was it. And our first meeting was scheduled for March uh, 16th or 18th, uh, March 18th, 2020. And um, in Ohio, that was, you know, pandemic closed everything down. So we'd never met and we went online to zoom and that that's why we have 1800 members today, right? I tried to limit it to 12. We have 1800 because Everyone was just sitting around with nothing to do. So we started inviting guests and we got some pretty high profile guests to come to our meeting. And so um, the one, one of the one of our founders, Steve Sue, he's a he's a physician, actually. Um, I met him at the active meetup and we were talking and I remember it was just it was a, an epiphany because it's scary. It's it's hard to invest in alternatives because you don't you don't know anything about them. You don't know anybody else doing it. Your neighbors think you're crazy. They all, they'll talk about their 401k, but you talk about syndications. They think you're nuts. Well, I was, so I met Steve and I was talking to him and not only was he in one of the same operators I was with, he was in one of the same exact deals and the level of relief. Here's a doctor, a smart guy. He's doing the same thing. I am. It just gave me confidence. And that's what left field investors is about, right? It's about bringing together people like-minded, not like-minded like robots marching down the road, but like-minded that we're all looking to pursue financial freedom and build wealth for our families so we can have, you know, whatever financial freedom means to you so we can have that. And, and that's what our community is about. So we have five founders and I met a couple of them along the way. And, and um, you know, the, and then we had some others that were just part of our community who were really excited about helping out. And they became um, what 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 became left field investors. I mean, we started our name was Sea Pig Columbus Passive Investing Group. Not a very good brand. <laughs> so um, once uh, we got yeah. left field investors, we started rolling. Very interesting. Um, and on your, I've been touring your web page as well too. Uh, I see the picture of the team. It's a great picture. Uh, I also noticed that on there you have um, uh, partners on there too. And you just mentioned Columbus, which is very interesting. Because I see Bush Tax on there, and uh, I know that they're an Ohio-based uh, firm as well, too. So probably, probably some colleagues that we bump shoulders with together here. We don't even know it. Yeah, well, B Bush Tax is he, uh, Nate Bush. There, he's the yeah. one that uh, coined the term uh, "lazy 1031," or at least first told, told me about it. And uh, since since then, we've seen it around a little bit. But uh, but Nate started that, and he he does the taxes for a lot in our community because what you want in a CPA is a couple of things. If you're a real estate investor, one, you want your CPA to be a real estate investor and you want your CPA to understand your business. So, you know, he started doing syndications or doing taxes for, for people like me uh, through my syndications. And now he's part of our community. He does a ton of the tax returns for us, which is nice on a couple of levels. One, he's really experienced with syndications. We also do group investing through a company called TribeVest. He does their tax returns as well. But the, one of the best things, and I have to whisper this in case Nate's listening, is <laughs> if you're living in L.A. or New York or wherever, you know, you're paying Columbus prices for your for your CPA. And he is um, he does a great job and he's affordable. So I didn't mean to turn this into an advertisement for Nate, but he does a good job and he's he's affordable. Yeah. So just, just I just mentioned that because it's on your partner page. And yeah. um, I, I, I just want to echo that, too, for all the listeners out there. You want to make sure that you, the people on your team and we build power teams, right? And that's how we uh, real estate is the business of relationships and those relationships. You build these power teams and you want to make sure that you're working with people who are doing what you're doing. Right. And you say that Nate, Nate has a has a, a portfolio himself. And the reason why I can say this and I'm echo on that, I just want to give a shout out to Nate and his team at, at Bush Tax, because that's exactly who does our taxes, too. So that's interesting um, and that's why that's how we came to them. We came to them because we were uh, we had what well, from the outside, Jim looked tough. We had you know, we uh, had an acquisition company. We were fixing and flipping uh, where we were wholesaling. Uh, you know, there was just a lot of moving parts in our buy and hold and working with them. We were able to clear it up. But it just goes to show, make sure that you're selecting the right people for your team. And that's where this growth comes from. And this left field group is, is just a symbol of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it's everything and and we've we've kind of broadened that 
to, you know, how do we find operators, GPs, sponsors? We use the community, right? How do people find a financial advisor? How do people find an attorney? How do people find a CPA? Our community, because we are all interested in the same thing, we're all investing in syndications. If someone finds a good attorney, they share it. If someone finds a good GP, they share it. That's how we vet sponsors. We're we're turning community into a verb. Um, you know, we 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 get a new sponsor in or operator, and we community that operator, right? The whole community vets that 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 company. Or if we get a deal, we community the deal where everyone is is looking together and analyzing the deal and sharing information. CPAs, we community the CPA. You know, Nate does a great job, but if he messes up on one person's everyone's going to know it and they're going to share that. So he has to, and not just Nate, but people that work with us, they have to continually do their best because if they don't, those experiences are going to be shared. Yeah. And uh, this is what I've heard too. It's like when, when something goes wrong or, you know, uh, when somebody gets dirt on their name, that's is how, that's how it happens. It goes around because you want to, as a, um, an investor with integrity, those things like it's, it's, man, it's just, it's infuriating when something, when somebody knowingly does wrong. Yeah. And, and we have, um, you know, we have a forum at left field investors where our members can, can post and talk about things. And one of the categories in that forum is red flag sponsors. And those are sponsors that we would never, ever invest with again. And people post and they say, here's why, you know, and we have, they have the reasons. And then other people add in, Hey, yeah, I had this experience. And, and then a lot of times you get the oh, wow, I didn't know that I was in conversation with that operator. I'm not going to invest with them because of your bad experience. So it's not just sharing the positive, but it's also sharing the, the struggles and the, and the mistakes and, um, you know, and learning from each other. And talk about sharing mistakes. I, I just want to throw this out there, too. There's a book coming out called Avoiding Rookie Errors uh, as a Left Field Investor, right? Tell us a little yeah, bit about that. that. That's written by Steve Sue, uh, the guy I mentioned. He, he's a he's a physician, and the the subtitle is Twenty Lessons Learned from Fourteen Years of Passive Investing in Private Syndications." This is, wow. you know, I, I'm I'm biased, so you'll know that, right? Because he's a founder of Left Field Investors. But this is the best book um, for passive investors that, that I've that I've read yet, and the, and the reason is. It, it's easy to read. It's chock full of great advice from Steve's experience as a passive investor. And it's good for, you know, someone new who's just starting out. It's also good for someone like me who's invested for years and, and is in, you know, 50 or 100 syndications. I learned things. And the what you're doing is you're learning from others' mistakes, which is a shortcut. Now I don't have to go and make those mistakes, right? I don't have to make some of the mistakes Steve did because I'm learning about them in the book and I can prevent them. And that's why this book is so powerful. But that's really the, the purpose of a community, right? Is to share knowledge and make everybody better. And that's also the purpose of this book, Avoiding Rookie Errors as a Left Fielder. Um, I don't know when this podcast will be uh, released, but it's coming out in just a couple of days. So a couple of days. So it's coming out here in September of 2023. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I look to grab a copy of that for sure. And you mentioned the community, uh, Jim, uh, you wanted to cap it at 12, but it's at 800, 1800 now. Is this something where people can still join? I mean, what do you have to like wait till somebody comes out of the bank before you goes in, before you go in it? Like what's going on? No, no, you you can join. There's a couple different uh, levels. There's a, you know, a free membership where you just, you know, you sign up with your email address and you get access to to a few things in the community, including some of our, we do a lot of webinars, lunch and learns, trainings. Uh, we have monthly meetings, so you get access to all of that. And then we also have um, another membership. Co- it's called the Infield, and that's a paid membership. It's $199 a year. And that gets you access to some of the deal flow we have from from our partner sponsors. Um, we we we're not GPs. We're not you know we don't make money fr- on the raise, but we do have partners who will present deals for our community, and you can get that with the infielder membership plus the forum I mentioned, some investor tools. There's just a lot of stuff in there. But yeah, we I'm what we're most proud of about our community is the culture of it. And I don't know that we built that intentionally, but it's just a lot of really good people helping each other. We're all kind of rowing the boat in the same direction. And we are always looking for uh, for new members because the more quality people we have, the more we can learn, but also the more deal flow we'll get because people, you know, operators will see that we have 1800 LPs and, and they want to do their best for us, right? Because they want all those LPs. So the, the bigger the group gets that we don't want to just grow it to 20,000 just for fun. 
We want quality people who are actually investing as LPs. And just to mention, I know you, you talk to a lot of uh, physicians. We do have a large, uh, a large physicians group, and there's actually in the community, we have private clubs. And one of those private clubs is for uh, healthcare professionals. And that's just because they have common interests and they can they can talk and, you know, they, they have some things that, you know, regular people like you and me might not understand. And so that's what they talk about in their club. Yeah, it's that um, kind of like being scared to do something new and being able to, hey, uh, uh, you know, with the lifestyle, how do I make the change? How do I go different? Because so, you know, we talked about it. Well, from your experience, too, Jim, it's like, OK, I'm leaning on my uh financial advisor, my financial consultant to help guide me. And then when I get a no, but I see all of this out here in left field that's working, you know, how yeah. do I make that change? So reaching outside, outside of your direct uh, associations to uh, see what other people are doing. And it's so helpful to go and talk with people who are actually doing it. And those Absolutely. errors, those errors that are happening right now, I think, um, you know, every, so much in our life is cyclical and the way that residential is uh, kind of offset from commercial. I feel that commercial is kind of like in this swing right now, forced by interest rates, forced by this, what happened with uh, the bridge loans, um, insurance, taxes, you know, all of this stuff going on. Tell us a little bit about how how the community, you know, can you speak generally for the community on on where multifamily is right now? Yeah, I, I think if for an investor, it's probably this could be the next few months, years could be one of the best times to invest. Now, the the problem is the deals that some of us invested in, you know, in late 21 and then throughout 2022, those deals, some of them are in trouble because, as you said, everyone was using bridge debt, which is adjustable debt. And what happens is when the interest rates go up so fast, so far that you know that that puts some properties underwater. So there's some distressed properties and if you had invested over the last couple of years, you might be in some of those and you're probably going to lose some money, right? It's it's an investment that happens sometimes, but if you you know have the courage to keep going, you're also going to make money because now that you know we're kind of getting rid of some of the problems, right? People aren't doing bridge debt as much. Or if they do, they're doing rate caps and protecting those investments a little bit better. Insurance costs is another huge issue, but that's kind of happened. It might still happen, but it's not going to be a surprise. The problem for multifamily is it had a couple of surprises that no one really saw coming. People saw coming interest rate rises. They didn't see the the speed. So some of these um, operators were basically multifamily flippers, Right, they, their goal is to sell the property in two years by forcing appreciation. Well, they, that they they did that with really low interest rates. So when their costs doubled or more because their interest rate component of the cost went up so much, they just can't they can't make the numbers work anymore. So right now it's just uncertainty, and I think over the next few months that you know buyers and sellers' prices will hopefully match up. There'll be less uncertainty, and then some of these distressed properties will be on the market as they already are. And and you can get it get to them at you know much better, much lower prices or, or much better terms than than you were a year or two ago. And what I'm hearing right now, so what I'm hearing right now is the perfect time to uh, prepare to join communities like Left Field Investors and start learning, uh, doing master classes, understanding how to vet the jockey, not the horse, how to how to see a deal through full cycle, right? And pick up these little seeds of curiosity, start asking these questions because when this when this does turn, it, it's gonna be remarkable because every time there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. And I feel, you know, in this cyclical uh, world that it's the time is coming. So what time better than now, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. If you were 2006, seven, eight, you know, think things were were rough and difficult, and those that jumped in at you know 2009, 10, 11 did great, right? And then just just rode that for the and and this could be, I mean, you never know, but this could be that kind of opportunity because there are still you know housing is way underbuilt in the U.S. If you look at demographics and all of that, so there's opportunity there. It's just you know you have to, as you said, you got to find the right jockey um, so that they can they can steer you where you need to go. If you could go back 10 years, Jim, and uh, tell yourself something, what would it be? It would have been go much, much bigger into real estate, 
right? That and and you know, it's it's when's the best time to plant a tree 30 years ago? When's the second best time now? Right. That's how I feel about real estate. If I had known about real estate, I had I was just getting into it 10 years ago. If I had known about it 10, 20, 30 years and gotten into like I am now, you know, I would be so much farther along. And it's just to me, it just makes complete sense that you're buying assets that produce income rather than speculation, right? I don't know of anybody that I know in my in my circle or who I know of or heard of that got rich on the stock market, right? You either own a business or you own real estate. That's the way to build wealth and get financial freedom. And for me, financial freedom means I don't have to work if I don't want to. I can make my W-2 job optional, right? If I was a physician, I could maybe go part-time because I don't need the income. And then you just, your, your life becomes freedom. Freedom. And uh, I heard this yesterday, money irrelevancy, money irrelevant. I like that. It's beautiful. And if you just even think of it, um, I think that also aligns Jim with the idea of being content, but not complacent. And you mentioned too, uh, you know, what wealthy means to you. Um and that that's so important. So those are there's so many things that you have to figure out in the mindset. This is an application that helps you get to wherever it is you want to go, whatever it is that right. you want to do, whether it be a number. I always encourage um, everyone to keep asking yourself why until you get past the number, because that's where the happiness piece is. Beyond yeah. that, these these are the things that that we can implement to get there. And we hear it so many times when I, I love asking that question, um, you know, uh, if if I would have gotten into real estate before, if I, because I feel the same way. I don't want to change that. Everybody's got their own path. I don't want to change my path. Um, but looking back at the same time, it's like, man, if we would just gotten into real estate earlier and we hear this all the time. Why? Why? Is it still the question? Like, I love begin to share this with with listeners and and keep harping on that. So, why is it that it's still that way? Like, we can just preach until we're blue in the cheeks, but it's always going to be that way, too. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, so we're talking um, in our community. There's there's traditional finance, right? Standard finance, which is what you see from Wall Street. It's what everybody's doing. It's easy. You know how to do it. You throw money in your 401k, you put money in your brokerage account, and everyone's doing it. So it, it feels safe, right? It feels normal. Then you have alternative um, investments, which is real estate or syndications. And that's scary because no one understands it. it it's, it's hard to, you know, you, the, the investments are hidden, right? Because some of them you can't even advertise. So where do you find them? And so what we're trying to do at Left Field Investors is a third way, community personal finance, right? That's where... Now you, you're doing alternative finance, but use the community so it's not scary. It's not unattainable. You're using other people. And so it really struck me when you were explaining that the thing about what makes alternatives easier is a community. It doesn't have to be left field investors. Of course, I'm biased. I think it's a great community, but there's all kinds of communities out there. I just don't see a way that you comfortably get into alternative investments without a community. I remember setting my first wire. It was terrifying, right? Yeah. I sent one yesterday. Also terrifying. But if you're in a community and you know other people have sent a wire to that wire address, then you get a little bit more comfortable. If you know other people are investing with that same operator, you're a little bit more comfortable. If you go into some weird asset class like car washes, but you're doing it with others, you feel a little bit more comfortable. Now, all of these investments are not going to work out. Some are going to go bad, right? Just like they do in the stock market. But at least you're starting from a place of you have a community you trust and you can use their expertise to, to make a change in your life for something better. The changes in my life that have made my life better always come around, come from being around the right people. And if the listeners want to do this, it's leftfieldinvestors.com. They can yes. find that. They can find your community there. They can email you directly at Jim Pfeiffer. Which, no, it's Jim at Left Field Investors. Yes. We would confuse them if we would say email Jim at Jim Pfeiffer and then have to spell that, right? <laughs> This exactly. Jim at Leftfield Investors. Go to leftfieldinvestors.com. This is the way that it happens. And for me, my family, my life, uh, me as a person, when I get around uh, high level people, when I get around good people, I can see these incremental, just massive jumps in progress in my life, not only in investing, but as a person in general, a father, a husband, yeah. a friend, a leader. When you're in the room with people like this, things get different. 
So, uh, man, I just appreciate your time today, Jim. Thank you again for coming on, man. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was great. I, I think we could talk for hours and hours and hours. And I always say this, but I mean, we mentioned so many little pieces in there and I just got to hold back and say, okay, hold on. This is the, let's just keep rolling. I think the community yeah. is the biggest piece here. Um, and I just want to express that to the, to the listeners out there today in the book too, when the book comes out, um, take a look at that. And man, I'm excited to learn from that as well, too, because I'm ready to dive in. I'll see you in left field, Jim. All right. Thanks, Brad. It's great seeing you. All right, man. And to the listeners, thank you again for your time and attention here again today. Don't forget to head to the to the uh, website there, leftfieldinvestors.com and check it out. I always love you know, picking through the the team, uh, seeing who's on the team and the the partners, which is really important too. So take some time, check into that. And thanks again for listening to us today. If you get the chance, leave us a review on Spotify or Apple. It helps us reach other people. So uh, we are out here yelling from the rooftops. This new, uh, this it's not new. It's time tested. It is a real asset. It should no longer be. I'm, I'm going for it now. It should no longer be called alternative investing. This should be the new norm. Let's make left field the whole field. But thank you again for your time. Uh, if you have any questions for us, info at physicianwellsystems.com. Uh, thanks again. We'll talk to you next time. Time.